Wait, wait, your name is what? A and I and I killed who? Pre prepare to die. Yeah. Okay. November 30th, 1940. Their leaders have been so full of confidence and so sure of victory, but that confidence does not ensure victory. And this week, both the Italians and the Japanese fail. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the Greek counteroffensive against the Italians continued to gain ground, but the Italians suddenly gained more allies as several nations became Axis powers, and the Chinese detected a buildup of Japanese forces in Hubei province. This week, that buildup becomes an attack. In the Yixiang and Sha region of Hubei province against Chinese nationalist and guerrilla forces, this is the central Hubei operation, codenamed Han River Operation to the Japanese. The attack is launched the morning of the 25th, and the Japanese break through in several places. They do a lot of damage, but the Chinese know the local mountainous terrain, and by the 26th are slowing the Japanese down. A Chinese counterattack the 27th forces the Japanese back in several places, and the 28th, Japanese commander Waishiro Sonobe orders his forces back to their starting points. The Japanese lose a lot of men in the retreat until air cover can arrive and put a stop to that. The whole operation, a failure for the Japanese, is finished by the 30th with some 5,000 Japanese soldiers killed and 7 to 8,000 wounded. I do not have numbers for the Chinese. There are Japanese sources that claim the operation was actually a probe to find Tang Enbo's forces. They do not succeed in this if it is, in fact, the purpose of the operation. One thing that was supposed to happen was a Japanese victory right when Japan finally recognizes Wang Jingwei's puppet Nanking government as the Chinese government on the 30th. See, that would mess with Chinese morale. Instead, the Japanese get the opposite. But Greek morale is certainly getting a boost as their counteroffensive continues gaining ground. I've talked a bit about it the past couple of weeks, but I never went over the Greek order of battle, so here it is in general. Eight infantry divisions, two infantry brigades, and a cavalry division take part in the counteroffensive. In the west is the first corps, in the center the second corps in the mountains, and then the fifth and third corps to the north in western Macedonia. The Greek army lacks tanks and anti-tank weaponry, so a standard tactic is to stick to the mountain ridges and avoid descending into valleys whenever possible. The ultimate goal of the counteroffensive is the port of Valona. Capturing this would leave the Italians with only one Albanian port from which to reinforce their army. But just as the Italian advance in the first place was a logistical nightmare, the further the Greeks advance towards and into Albania, the more it becomes one for them, even as the Italian lines now grow shorter and more stable. So the plan is for the TSDM, the Western Macedonia section, to hold their positions and apply some pressure, and the First Corps to try to advance up the coast. Second Corps is to be the pivot and maintain the link between flanks. So this week, First Corps is moving into Albania along the Drinos River, while Second Corps is moving towards Fresher. The 13th Division, with the Third Corps, takes Pogradek, the 30th, with no opposition, as the Greeks keep pushing on. I've mentioned that Hitler has been worried that Greece would give the British bases from which they could bomb the Romanian oil fields, a big source of German oil. But he has other worries too here. What if Greece should win? And, and what if Greece and its ally Britain consolidate that victory in the Balkans? After all, the only sort of enemy Britain has had in the region is Bulgaria, who'd been an enemy in World War I, but, but they're trying to stay uninvolved. And Greece and Yugoslavia provide nearly half of the aluminum ore used by German industry. Yugoslavia, 90% of the tin and nearly half of the lead. What if all that came under threat from British bombers or possibly worse, British diplomacy? Heck, Britain's support for Slavic independence in 1918 and 1919 is partly responsible for Yugoslavia's existence. What would that then mean for Hitler's war plans? Likely nothing good, so there are wheels within wheels here. It's also interesting to see Hitler's thoughts about enemies he'd already defeated, for example, France. Now, 
we saw last month that Hitler was interested in getting Vichy France to maybe actively join the war against Britain, much as he was trying the same with neutral Spain as well. He'd even met with French leader Philippe Pétain, but Hitler was reluctant to make any actual concessions and was suspicious of the French, even though there were plenty in the German army, navy, and diplomatic service that were all for some sort of accommodation. But by now, there is more reluctance than ever on the French side. See, Vichy French leaders, maybe even more so than German leaders, had been certain Britain would be defeated. And it is now obvious that that is not going to happen anytime soon. Okay, so? So, even though American aid to Britain is more of a stream than a river at this point, it is also pretty obvious that that is going to change. And the high command in Vichy France, whatever they think of Britain, does not want to find itself in an open war against the United States. The Germans, of course, only make any sort of accommodation that much harder by going out of their way to be jerks to the French rather than making any concessions that might possibly win them over. There was the imposition of, of huge financial burdens as reparations, the day-to-day -day treatment of the French citizens, and especially the French shopkeepers and food and drink establishments. And Germany still keeps most of the one and a half million French POWs as POWs, which leads to the question of who the French would use to fight the British if they are ever so inclined to do so. And this week on the 28th, the German Ministry of Propaganda sends a note to Otto Abertz, German ambassador in Paris, the result of our victorious struggle should be to smash French predominance in cultural propaganda in Europe and in the world. Any support given to French culture is a crime against the German nation. So you may wonder why Hitler even keeps Vichy France independent in the first place. Well, since Germany does not have naval superiority, it is the only practical way to try and keep the French colonies from being used by the enemy. But I'll peer a few days into the future now and say that already in December, Operation Attila, plans to occupy Vichy France, are being drawn up just in case. Another operation is happening this week though, Operation Collar. Three British merchantmen sail from Gibraltar with supplies from Malta and Alexandria without a loss. This is the first time it's merchant ships and not warships doing the transport on what Mussolini called the Italian Lake. Or is that what really happened? See, that's what David Somerville says. Other sources say that the convoy is escorted by the cruisers Manchester and Southampton and eventually the destroyer Hotspur. Further north, the British do have a strong force in the waters though, Force H, which we've seen before. This is under James Somerville, and they do battle with the Italian Navy the 27th at the Battle of Spartivento. The Italians under Admiral Inigo Campioni, and I cannot hear that name without thinking of the Princess Bride, sorry to break character there, Inigo Campioni have two battleships, six heavy cruisers, and 14 destroyers. The British match them in destroyers and have a battleship, a battle cruiser, a heavy cruiser, and five light cruisers, and some smaller ships. The British do also have an aircraft carrier, which is an advantage, but the Italians have larger and longer range guns, which is one to them. Campioni has orders, however, to avoid a decisive battle unless he has big odds in his favor. So there's only a brief firefight and one British cruiser and one Italian destroyer are damaged. Also in the Mediterranean this week, on the 26th, aircraft from the carrier Eagle attack Tripoli and to the southeast, there is news from Egypt. This month, the British crypto analysts working in Cairo at the Combined Middle East Bureau, which is the Bletchley Park station there, break the ciphers of the Italian high command. So Italian plans and maneuvers all over Africa are now read basically as soon as they are issued. And there are notes from all over Europe this week. Rioting and civil disturbances begin in Romania the 27th. This begins after the Yelava massacre the night before, when 64 political prisoners at Yelava Penitentiary are killed by the Iron Guard. The 27th, the Guard arrests and executes prominent figures, including former Prime Minister Nikolai Yorga. The army clamps down and quiets things eventually with some German help. But here's the thing, the Iron Guard 
did this independently of Conducator, national leader, Jan Antonescu, and we are now seeing an escalating power struggle between him and the Iron Guard under Hori Asima. On the 28th in Germany comes the premiere of yet another rapidly anti-Semitic film, The Eternal Jew. Für den Juden gibt es nur einen Wert. Das ist Geld. Wie und womit er das Geld verdient, ist ihm völlig gleichgültig. Die Juden aber sind ein Volk ohne Bauern und ohne Arbeiter. Ein Volk von Parasiten. This film is presented as a documentary, though it is no such thing. And with a massive Luftwaffe bombing raid on Liverpool the 29th and one on Southampton the 30th, the week comes to an end. Along with the Han River Offensive, though the Greek counteroffensive does not end at all, nor do British convoy and escort actions in the Mediterranean. Things aren't looking so good for the Axis this particular week, being pushed back in both Greece and China. And those invasions and those attacks were supposed to be so easy since, you know, the invaders just knew that they were better people, better armies. It becomes so monotonous since we've seen it time and again in both this world war and the last one that you would think people would wise up. Hubris never leads where you think it will. If you'd like to see how Romania and other nations struggled with fascist movements in the 1930s, you can check out our Between Two Wars 1932 video on the rise of fascism right here, soon. Our patron of the week is Don Mershon. It is thanks to patrons like Don that we can cover the war in its entirety, even as it expands to newer and newer places and grows ever and ever larger. So please join the Time Ghost Army at patreon.com or timeghost.tv and ring that bell and click subscribe. See you next time.